Father, again, it's wonderful to know that you're our loving Heavenly Father, that our lives are hid with Christ in God. As we approach your word this evening, may the Holy Spirit be our teacher. Open our hearts to precious truths, that which is foolish, that which is ignorant. Filter it out, strip it away so that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In our Wednesday series, we're studying parables, and I was asked to address a particular passage in Luke chapter 11, and so I will do that, uh, even though it's not a parable. Uh, and I do appreciate all of those suggestions that come my way as to, as to how to go about uh, this series in parables. As we come to this chapter, chapter 11, the Lord's offered uh, the kingdom as a result of John the Baptist's introduction of the Messiah. Uh, uh, that kingdom's been rejected. And so Jesus is now more and more dealing with his disciples and, uh, and he's headed toward Jerusalem. At the end of chapter 10, he was at Bethany, just a, a little ways from Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit's been giving us uh, illustration after illustration of the work of Christ in ushering in the kingdom. And so the disciples, they came to him in, here in chapter 11, saying, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so the Lord gives them what, uh, what we see in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, here in Luke, uh, we're, we're late in his ministry. In Matthew 6, we're early in his ministry. So uh, whether this is a private instruction to just his immediate disciples or whether it includes the 70, uh, not sure. But what I suggest to you is, and this is probably here I go get myself in trouble again, but uh, what I suggest to you here is that uh, in the prayer to follow, he did not give them a model prayer. Uh, thousands uh, and thousands of churches around the world today will pray uh, this kingdom prayer, uh, thy kingdom come. And uh, I'm obligated to point out that those who listen to him, those who are being taught, can reach only one conclusion, and that's the promised kingdom. Look at the context. I think there's only one kingdom. It's the one that's promised. It's the one that we read about in, in Obadiah. Uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name. Uh, uh, I'm looking at the uh, original text. The Greek, Thy name be hallowed. Uh, the word is uh, hagios. It's the Greek word for, for holy, for sanctified. Uh, Thy name be hallowed. Uh, it is in heaven. It will be in earth during the kingdom. Thy kingdom come. It hasn't come yet. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ sincerely offered the kingdom uh, to His people. He came unto His own. His own received Him not. Uh, I believe in the design and the plan of God. The kingdom was, was to be rejected, and so it was. And I, I, I thank God tremendously for that fact because if He had not done that, I wouldn't, probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. We need to realize that God wasn't mincing words when He said that it was evil that Christ be crucified, but God ordained it, an evil man took uh, and crucified Him. Just as exactly as God predetermined that it should be done. If, we, if you've read the book of Acts, then, then you know that. 
text says, Thy kingdom come. So it's going to come. There's no doubt it's going to come. And, and what he's telling them in their worship before God is that they should look forward to that promised hope. Uh, not some mystery kingdom, not some spiritual kingdom, but the kingdom when Christ will be ruling and reigning at Jerusalem. The expression here in verse 2, Thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth, uh, which, is, uh, which is actually copied from Matthew, is not there in the Greek. It's, it's, it's an expression that, that, that really just means uh, His will is done in heaven. Uh, so the difference in, in this expression is that His will is also done in earth. It is. There isn't anything done that God didn't will. So what Christ is saying is, is they need to realize that God's will is done in heaven. His will is, is also done in earth. And we need to recognize that. Uh, I think we're looking at verses 5 through 13 here. Going through the original, uh, the Greek interlinear, I'm trying to, I've been trying to look at some of the particular aspects of the grammar and pay close attention to, to the word meanings. Uh, but what I see here is just a kingdom context with a prayer that's in the context of that coming kingdom, which was rejected, but it was, but uh, I think if we, we brought, we took, got in a time machine and we went back uh, to the land of Palestine, you know, uh, when, uh, and sat before Christ and listened to Him teach and, and all that concerning the kingdom. I think if we were able to do that, uh, we would, all of this would be filtered through an entirely different uh, mindset than what we have today as Christians in which the church was a ministry in this a mystery, the church was a mystery in this context. Uh, many Christians need, they need, I've, I've, I spend, the, it seems like I spend the majority of my life talking uh, to Christians about their need for peace and joy and rest and the confidence that's their, it's the, that is their right in Christ. And it's astounding to me how many people who profess to know Christ, uh, who profess to know Him and love Him, who don't have that high level of confidence, which, which is their right as a New Testament believer in Christ. You know, God's the creator of heaven and earth. My father owns a, a cattle, uh, the cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, there isn't anything that he needs. Uh, there isn't anything I can do for him that he can't do for himself. Uh, and we, but we have such a tremendous emphasis on service today that that many fail to see the Savior. You know, thousands and thousands of people today will be told what they can do for Christ, but few, few will be told what Christ has done for them. God's will is done in heaven and the, and the angels recognize that it's done. Uh, God's will is done in earth. Man doesn't recognize it, but He will when Christ is ruling and reigning. It's God who provides. Verse 3, continue to give us. Uh, so it, it's God who continually gives us what we need, everything we need day by day. You, you can't tell me that there's no application here for the church, but the context is the presentation of the kingdom. And the prayer is specifically crafted, designed uh, to be in relationship to that discussion Christ is having with them concerning the up and coming kingdom, uh, the kingdom age on earth. No, uh, God gives us what we need. And I don't think we need to look any further than that. Uh, we're told not to really look any further than that. That's one of my biggest challenges. I look, I look far, you know, I worry about things just like everybody else. 
that I shouldn't, but uh, we have what we need day by day, and He gives that to us. Forgive our sins or our debts, as, as it says, as, as we forgive everyone that's indebted to us. Well, we do forgive them when they pay it, uh, and they no longer owe a debt. And, and, and in the kingdom age, folks, it'll be recognized that that debt, the debt, is paid. And Christians today ought to know that. Many don't, but they ought to know that. Yeah, I believe this is a kingdom prayer and that there's an application for us. Uh, I'm absolutely persuaded that most Christians don't believe that their debt was paid. Uh, I'm astounded at how many profess to know him and who are still living under the debt of sins. It's sad, it's tragic, but that's just but that's the case, and it's always been the case. Uh, this is nothing new. Nothing new under the sun. You know, one of the great problems, I think, uh, with humans is that, you know, us, us homo sapiens, is that, uh, you know, it's what are we going to do in, in, in the day of judgment? You know, and, and somehow or another, they, you know, we feel that, you know, we're going to enter into some kind of judgment. There is no judgment for those of you who are in Christ. No condemnation. Uh, it's one of the things that actually bothered the Israelites in, in the book of Ezekiel. You know, God said, uh, you know, if a man's a sinner, if he commits evil over and over and over and over again and he turns from that evil to righteousness, all of that evil will be forgotten. You know, and they say, well, that's, that's not fair. And people read that in Ezekiel and they say, well, you know, I don't understand how the Jews could say that and yet they say it today. It is, it is, it's inconceivable to, to them that someone who knows the Lord Jesus Christ who committed some terrible evil that it'll, it'll be forgotten. Folks, your sins, have been, you've been, they've been washed as white as snow, whiter than snow, removed as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea, forgotten and remembered no more. God says He remembers them no more. Okay? Why do you? You know, my Bible here says that the former things will be remembered no more. And that the evil that man did won't be remembered. Uh, we were those who were dead in trespasses and sin. Uh, if you studied with us through the, uh, the Romans, uh, the book of Romans, uh, you know, we were condemned because Adam was condemned, and then we were condemned because we ourselves sinned willfully. That's Romans 7. And, and, uh, and then, uh, it was in that condition. In, God redeemed you. You're, you've always been His child. Always. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Uh, you were dead in trespasses and sins, but it was when you were dead in trespasses and sins that uh, God redeemed us. He says we weren't seeking Him. We weren't working for Him. Uh, we weren't interested in Him. We really didn't care a whole lot about Him. Uh, we turned to our own way, and God laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. And He tells us that the former things will be remembered no more, that we're new creations in Christ, and that we don't face judgment. I think we need to recognize that God is dealing in our lives as He deems best. You know, it's, that's tough because we see things happen in our lives that we just don't like. You know, we look at how He touched Job. Uh, Job didn't have any idea what was going on, but God did. All the, all the angels in heaven did. Even Satan did. Job didn't. But it was exactly according to the plan and the purpose of God. 
He knows the way I take. He says, when he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Why does he, how does he know the way I take? You know, why does he know the way I take? Because he laid it out. Because he mapped it. And because he touched every experience in, in, in my life. And when he's tested me, I'll come forth as gold. There's no doubt. There isn't one shadow of a doubt. Okay? That truth guides my relationship with my Heavenly Father in the, in the deepest recesses of my heart, my soul, my mind. Uh, you know, there's not the slightest doubt I'm His and He's mine and I know He directs my path. I know He's the one who said He'd never cease to sustain and uphold me. I wish so many other Christians knew that. What He wants us to realize in this outline of prayer here and, and our worship of Him is that it, it, it will be in the kingdom age Christ who provides. I don't know how many times I, I've just really emphasized the importance of context. The problem so many Christians have is they read stuff out of context. Uh, they also read their own experiences into, into the text. So that prayer, even though it's a kingdom prayer, it teaches us that we're, we're safe, we're secure, we're satisfied in the hands of God. The debt's been paid. There's not one single thing that needs to be done for you to stand righteous and holy before God. You stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And you, you're, you're unreprovable in His sight because he, he died in your place. You know, you know we're willing to forgive or, or to release uh, somebody uh, from his debt when it's paid. Don't you think God is? Is there any single debt that hasn't been paid? Or was the payment made on that cross initiated by that birth some 2,000 years ago? Was it sufficient? Did Christ do enough? Well, there's many Christians today, they sing, they'll stand up and sing, Jesus paid it all, but apparently they don't believe it. He did, folks. He paid it all. There's no judgment for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. And it staggers my mind, you know, to look around and see so many Christians today who doubt that Christ paid our debt in full. But, you know, He didn't just do that. He actually cre credited to our account His righteousness, okay? His righteousness. You stand before God as a believer in Christ as righteous as God's own Son. That's what He says. That's not me saying that. That's what God says. Accepted in the Beloved. Lead us not into testing. Testing. That, that word there, it, it's translated tempted, temp, tempt, test. You know, the deliverance from evil is in Matthew 6, but it's not here in our text. The, the kingdom age, is, folks, is going to come with some real dif difficulty, uh, real hardship. It's not going to come in a, in a flash, okay? Uh, it's not going to do that. No, there's going to be great difficulty. Nations are going to rise up against nation. Uh, there'll be wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, famine, and... Yeah, you know, you know the you know the story. You know all all that you see around us today. There's suffering in this world that absolutely defies description. But it's going to get worse. Uh, I'm no Joyce Myers, okay. Uh, it's going to get worse. The day will come when all nations will gather against Jerusalem to battle. You know, we apparently are, are hearing some rumors of peace in an area where there, there will not be peace. There's no peace to the wicked, says God. Peace, folks, is in our Lord Jesus Christ. If, that's, if you're looking for that, seeking that, the only place you're going to find it is in Him. You know, if we look at it from a human standpoint, 
you know, our, our, our cheapest investment really is Israel. It, you know, our greatest front is Israel. We don't give them enough. We don't help them enough. You know, I'd rather have them fight the battle over there than send our boys. You know, and we're asking them to give up precious territory. I don't know how much our current administration stands for Israel. I do know that this country has abandoned God a long time ago, and everything that you're seeing today is a result of that. I'm convinced of that more than I'm convinced of anything. So our Lord then goes on with a couple of uh, illustrations here. Now uh, beginning at verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he, he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Now, I don't know if this friend or, or of his is a friend of the friend. I mean, you know, you understand now that we have three friends here. You know, I have a guy who has this fella as a friend who owns some loaves or, or cakes of bread, but he also has another friend. And now I don't, I don't know if they've ever been introduced. But look at the contrast, folks. All right, here's a friend coming to a friend. You come, you come to a friend. Well, you come to God Almighty, your heavenly Father. You come to a Father who, who's never touched you except in love, whose only concern is, is that which is for your good. Not his good, but your good. But the illustration here is it's, it's just a friend. And he comes at midnight of all times. And all he wants is three loaves. That's all he wants. And the friend said, hey, wait a minute. I've already shut the door. Now, that's a, that's a perfect tense there in the Greek. Perfect tense. That door was shut. Probably had a lot of locks on it. You know, that was a lot of work back then, you know. And the friend inside says, don't give me trouble, don't keep on troubling me. And that's a present imperative. The door's been shut, and I intend to keep it shut. My children are with me. They're also in bed. You know, it's, it's impossible for me to rise and give you something to eat and, and, or your friend to eat, and, and you're really not asking for very much. Folks, there isn't anything uh, that God can't do. There's nothing too difficult for Him. You know, He works all things after the counsel of His own will. He spoke the worlds into existence. There's nothing that you could ask that's very, that's, that, that's very much to Him. Uh, but you are not a friend going to a friend, folks. You, you are His offspring. We are told in Hebrews chapter... We're told in Hebrews chapter 3, 2. It's Hebrews chapter 2. Forgive me for the, uh, the too long a pause here. I know the camera's rolling, but We're told in, in, in Hebrews 2, we're out of the same source. You and I, we're out of the same source. And you're going to a loving, heavenly Father. What a contrast. I mean, 
folks, friendship wouldn't be enough for this guy to give him what he's asking for, but shamelessness, okay, shamelessness. Are you getting this? Yet because of his shamelessness, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. That's verse 8. You know, I mean, if this, look, if this guy were really a friend, he'd get up and give the bread, right? Right? You know, he must not be much of a friend. But hold on a minute. Hold on just a minute. If the other guy was a friend, he wouldn't come at midnight knocking on my door, you know, and waking me up. You know, there's always two sides of a coin. A good friend would say, well, if you need the loaves, I'll, I'll, I'll get up and give them to you. But a good friend would also say, well, my friend's sound asleep. I'm not going to bother him because I really love him that much. It, it's, a, it's a terrible situation. You know, the, the fellow on the outside says, if you're really my friend, you'd give it to me. The fellow on the inside says, if you're really my friend, you wouldn't be pounding on my door late at night. But that's not your relationship to God, folks. You're not coming as a friend to a friend, but as a child to a father. If, if in this case, because this one friend wasn't ashamed to go bang on his door at midnight, you know, ain't a, ain't a whole lot of people I'd do that to, he'd probably arise and give him what he needs just to get rid of him. But God is so much more gracious. God's not sleeping. God doesn't have the door permanently locked. God isn't intimately concerned uh, about anything but your welfare, your best, your very best. And even though you may not be concerned about Him, if in this little story, the man would get what he asked for just because of his shamelessness. Uh, in my Bible, it says importunity. I think that's a poor, really bad translation. Just because he's not ashamed to go wake up a friend. You know, they ought to be embarrassed to do it. But, but since he's not, since he's not, he'll probably get what he wants. Verse 9, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. The context, once again, the context is clear, clearly shows it's a kingdom promise. That what he's saying in verse 9 is in the anticipation of that kingdom. That's the context. Christ has had yet to die. Folks, there's no church here. No Pentecost. It, it was absolutely true for Israel when Christ came unto His own and His own received Him not. Is there an application for us? Well, of course there is. I believe in the kingdom. They have God's Spirit and their new heart put within them in the same way. I can't emphasize that enough. In the same way in which you and I are a new creation in Christ. No, they're not members of the body of Christ, but, but in the same way. I'm absolutely persuaded that whatever the new creation asks for, seeks for, knocks for, it always gets. The problem is, folks, that we're all too well familiar with the old man and we're not nearly as familiar with the new. Dearly beloved, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to reign, He puts a new heart within them and a new spirit within them so that the asking, the seeking, the knocking is in agreement with the will of our Almighty, eternal God. I believe the application to us is solid. That for whatever that new creation does in its, in its communion and fellowship with God, 
the answer is there for everyone that asks receives and he that seeks finds and him that knocks it shall be open and and there are, there's millions of people who would rise up in anger and say that's not true steve i tried that that did not work well you ask and you receive because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your lusts you know where i read that verse and i say oh now lord that's you know, that's really not why I asked for that hundred million bucks. I mean, you know, I asked, I asked so that I could give a million dollars to my viewers and, and keep uh, 99 million. You know, that's, that's a yeah, good example of that. But I believe that new creation, that spirit-filled individual is always in unbroken communion and fellowship with the Father. I... Please, I said the new man, the new creation, okay? God has nothing to do with the old. If there's any broken fellowship, you're looking at the old man, the, the sin nature that we reckon ourselves dead to in Romans 6.11. Everyone that receives, I mean, look, well, think about it. I mean, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? You're a son, dearly beloved. You're, you're asking a heavenly father. You know, a, a human son asking a, a human father is no comparison at all to a new creation in Christ asking a heavenly father. If you ask for bread... That would be a request of the new creation. Just asking that. And we tend to take credit for even the things that we ask for. Well, I asked God. Well, I did something there. Okay, But you couldn't have even asked if it wasn't a, ma a characteristic of that new man. You know... If you ask for meat, would he give you a serpent? If you ask for that which was nourishing to your body, would he, you know, give you a, a snake? <laughs> would he give you that which comes from Satan? No, no way. If you ask for an egg, would he offer him a scorpion? You know, a, a human father wouldn't do that. What do you think a heavenly father would do? If you, then being evil, verse 13, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to him that asks him? See, Steve, we have to ask him for the Holy Spirit. Oh, wait, I wasn't thinking about the Holy Spirit at all. I was thinking about that big camel ranch, you know, uh, or something. Folks, look at the verse. Once again, it's a kingdom prayer. It's the entrance into the kingdom when God's Spirit will be poured out and all of those who are His will enter into that kingdom prepared for them before the foundation of the world. Of course, there's an application for us, but you know that you have the Holy Spirit. Don't go back here looking for it. You have the Holy Spirit. If you're a new creation in Christ, you've been baptized, identified into Christ, into the body of Christ. Uh, Jesus is speaking to His people Israel. There was no body of Christ at that time. Look, you've all read Romans 8. You know that His Spirit abides within you, remains within you. That isn't true of the people to whom Christ was speaking. It's not true of the nation Israel. The day will come, it will come, when it will be true. But it's, but it's true for you today. That Because Jesus Christ came and died in your place. It's true for you today. 
you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God so that God can say that all who are born of God cannot sin for a seed abides in, in them and they cannot sin because they've been born of God. That don't have any ability to sin. The new man has no ability to sin. You know, our, our, our focus, and it has been here all along, our focus, folks, our attention, our focus is, 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 our attention is directed toward heavenly things. On things above, folks, not on earthly things. He's speaking to Israel. The context is the kingdom. And, and everything that Satan, the world, the flesh could possibly think of is driven to direct your attention away from those heavenly truths. Back down here to things below. Look at the 13th verse. How much more shall your heavenly Father? I don't know of anybody that say God gives evil gifts you know, to His children. He, he only gives good gifts. He says you're his sons, you're his children, you're not just servants, but you're members of his household. It's, it's, it's God who made us, not we ourselves. We're his people, we're the sheep of his pasture. Though God takes everything away, no food in the field, no, no cattle in the stall, no work for, for, for man or beast, yet will I rejoice in the Lord my God. I mean, that ought to be the attitude the hope, the confidence that, uh, of every one of us. But sadly, it's not. Dearly beloved, He's your heavenly Father. He's not ashamed to call you His child, and we surely shouldn't be ashamed to call Him Father. He's a heavenly Father, he, and He gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. That's the remnant of Israel looking forward to the kingdom age. But He gave it to you and me who are new creations in Christ so that we have the mind of Christ and we have the mind of the Spirit. Thanks for joining us here on this Wednesday night. I love you all. I truly do rest in Him. And thanks for watching.